Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, powered by Advanced Takedown Tree Stands, episode number 196. Stacy Lynn Harris, hunting and homesteading in Alabama. It all started with venison. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Advanced Takedown Tree Stands, Covert Scouting Cameras, the Horny Buck Seed Company, the Eurohanger, and Morse Sporting Goods. <laughs> Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hi, this is John Stallone with Interviews with the Masters podcast. And when I'm not editing my own podcast, I'm listening to the Big Buck Registry with Jay Scott. This is Laura Zara from Naked and Afraid, and you're about to listen to my favorite podcast. Big Buck Registry. This is Scott Shaw, Swamp Hunter from Michigan. You're listening to my favorite podcast, The Big Buck Registry. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Jay, and I want to say, first and foremost, thanks for joining us once again on the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hope you're having a fantastic week. You want to buckle in for another great interview that we've got this week. We're changing it up a little bit. We're going to talk to a homesteader, a lady by the name of Stacy Lynn Harris, and she is from Alabama. She claims that the whole homesteading idea that and the lifestyle that she's gotten into came from venison. Her husband is a hunter and brought back lots of venison, and she wanted to find a good way to cook it, and then that led into gardening, and then that led into growing really good vegetables and, and fruits and honey and all kinds of other wild game and she just tries to live off the land but she does it with a flair with some style all good enough for a a blog that she writes frequently it has recipes and follows her lifestyle and techniques that she employs in this whole homesteading endeavor that she's in we talk about all her cookbooks that she wrote and uh, she tells a pretty darn good deer story so uh, we're going to talk to Stacy Lynn in just a little bit, but uh, we do have a couple of housekeeping items. First and foremost, we still are running the Harness Program. The Harness Program, as you may or may not know, we started a little while ago, and it's it's really just a, an effort to try to get tree stand harnesses into the hands of the people that don't have them. And the reason that they, they don't have them either is because they never got one, can't afford it, or just haven't really recognized the importance of it. So what we've figured out is that when you buy a tree stand, a lot of these tree stands now come with their own harness. And we often see those just set aside and not used. So if you have any in a package because you bought a tree stand and you would like to put them to good use, we are starting a collection over here at Big Buck Registry's headquarters, and we're uh, re-donating those to people in need, people that need them. So if you have some to donate, please email me, j at bigbuckregistry.com. I'll shoot you an address on where you can send them. And then likewise, if you need one, if you are in need of a tree stand harness because you don't have one now, please let me know, jay at bigbuckregistry.com. And as they come in, we'll get them shipped back out to you. And one more housekeeping item. We've been doing these live Facebook events on Thursday night at 8 o'clock. We're calling it Thursday Night Live. And what we're doing is we're going back to our guests that we've had on the podcast, and we're going live on Facebook in a TV show panel-type discussion. And it's a lot of fun. We're having some, we're cutting up, we're loosening up quite a bit, and it's a, it's, it's a good time. We had six people on there this past Thursday with Josh Kearney, and it turned into a, a party where we actually had Mike Behrman from The Living Room Buck came on the show at the same time, and then we had Kenyon Bankston from Southern Boys Outdoors. He joined on, then Billy Dodd joined on, and... Dusty was there, obviously, and, and then we were all there. So we and we, what was supposed to be half an hour turned into like an hour and a half, and it got viewed by 120,000 people uh, from the time we started to the next morning around six o'clock in the morning. So it's turned into a lot of fun. If you'd like to check us out, Thursday nights, eight o'clock on our Facebook page, Facebook Live. We're calling it Thursday Night Live on the BBR. 
But I think that's it for all the housekeeping stuff. Let's turn to Jim Keller with the Deer News. The Deer News this week is sponsored by the Eurohanger. You don't have to spend big bucks to hang your big buck. Get yourself a Eurohanger. Facebook.com forward slash Eurohanger, E-U-R-O-H-A-N-G-E-R. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Our first story this week, Indiana Deer Vehicle Crashes Drop, Still a Staggering Number. This story was originally featured on the IndyStar.com website. The Indiana Department of Natural Resources says the state's deer harvest fell last year, as did the number of deer struck by motor vehicles. The agency says deer vehicle collisions across Indiana numbered more than 14,000 last year, down nearly 9% from 2015. The department says in its recently released 2016 Indiana White-Tailed Deer Summary, the hunters last year harvested nearly 119,500 deer in Indiana. That was down 4% from the 2015 harvest of nearly 144,800 deer. The 10 counties with the highest harvest were Harrison, Noble, Franklin, Washington, Steuben, Park, Dearborn, Lawrence, Switzerland, and Green. The report contains other information on deer hunting, the use of depredation permits, deer vehicle collisions, and disease surveillance efforts. The entire report is at www.deer.dnr.in.gov under the Deer Management heading. Poaching becomes felony in New Mexico. This story was originally featured on the Spokesman Review website. If you like guns and free time, don't poach big game in New Mexico. New Mexico Governor Susana Martinez last week signed legislation elevating the wasting of game from a misdemeanor to a felony, according to Sporting Classics Daily. People convicted of poaching an elk, antelope, bighorn sheep, deer, ibex, oryx, or barbary sheep without a license or out of season will face a maximum sentence of 18 months in jail and up to a fine of $5,000. As a felon, convicted poachers would be unable to hunt with a firearm. These crimes traditionally have been classified as misdemeanors. The New Mexico Game and Fish Department gave its support to getting tougher on poachers with proposals made in 2013. The department has been saying that tougher penalties are needed as a deterrent to stop the waste of the state's wildlife. In two years preceding the agency's support of the proposals, conservation officers had investigated more than 200 cases in which big game animals had been unlawfully killed and their carcasses left to rot. Bra gets tangled in Highland Red Deer Stag's antlers. This story was originally featured on the BBC News website. A red stag deer has been photographed in the Scottish Highlands with a bra tangled in its antlers. The animal was spotted in Applecross and Wester Ross on the northwest coast earlier this week. Several red deer grazed around the houses in the village and the stag snagged the item of underwear while passing a washing line. Megan McKinney's managed to get the snap of the deer with its colorful antler decoration. Her friend Anne McRae, who also lives in Applecross and has photographed the deer in the village, said the animals were not tame but bold enough to come close enough to houses to feed. She said the deer came down from the nearby hill, the bee lock, to forage. Obviously, the deer were possibly seeking more than just forage. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Deer News. For links to the stories featured this week, please check out our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas for future topics or have any questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Thanks to Jim Keller with the Deer News. Without further ado, here is Stacy Lynn Harris. Stacey Lynn Harris, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? I am great. How are you? I'm doing quite well. Thank you for asking. Where are you at in the world right now? I am in Alabama, right outside Montgomery, Alabama, and it's kind of a little rural area that's growing and getting a little bit too big for my taste, although the people are awesome. That's that's pretty cool. All right, so you've got some, some growth going on that might in, impede on your, your homesteading yeah. and uh, the country style life yes 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 yeah we don't want that no i know isn't that the truth um i like it to stay you know to where you have big land owners around you but there's neighborhoods popping up and i get that too but when that happens you start seeing the the bees are not you know really producing the honey as much you they don't get as much to pollinate then you've got other situations that you know pop up like if people do have gardens right next to yours and then they're using you know a corn that has gmo in it and and you're trying to keep yours completely heirloom you know it can cause a problem when it's just right next door you know to you so i can see where how this 
conversation is going to expand a, a lot on that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Get, before we get into that that type of, of topic, and boy, it's that's a huge topic, and I want to dig deep on all that stuff about how you deal with cross pollination and the things you don't want in your garden versus things you do, and on the honey, and we've got questions about pollination and wild game and and your cookbooks. We've got a lot to talk about. Yes. Before we get there, how can you tell me about yourself? How'd you end up in Alabama? Are you from there originally? I am. I am. I have lived right here my entire life. So I moved. Well, you know, I've lived in Alabama my entire life. I've lived in Montgomery and the surrounding area my whole life until I got married and my husband went to dental school. So we moved to Birmingham after right after I took the bar exam, we moved to Birmingham and I also had a baby at the time. And so, um, that we lived there four years and then moved back. So, um, I, all but four years I've lived right here in the same spot, not in the same house, but in the same area, same area. Okay. All right. So Mm -hmm. you've, you've made a life of, of life, of, of life in Alabama. Yes. So you went to law school. What was that like? Well, you know, it was real intense. And I remember uh, my first semester in law school. Um, I remember coming home and telling my mom, I do not know anything. I feel like I'm in a different world with a different language and they talk about briefs and they don't mean underwear. They (laughs) mean briefs, law briefs. And I had to look the word up to even understand what that meant. So, um, so every, every word seemed like I was looking it up. Um, so it was, it was definitely a different world, but one that I really loved Uh, And I still really love it. It's just that I'm kind of an all or nothing type person. And when I started having kids, I didn't feel like I could be all that and all a mom at the same time. And so I put that on the shelf for a little bit. Gotcha. And that's certainly Uh so much that kids bring such a a whole new uh, perspective on life, don't they? they? They absolutely do. And they grow up so fast. They do grow up fast. And they eat a lot. I know. That my oldest is in dental school now, so wow. you know we were there. Just he was in the the neat thing. He was the first the kids like on the internet that was like they showed on the internet the other day a picture of us holding him at a baseball game, and that was yeah. when we were in um, dental school. And he's the first kid to go to dental school of a dental graduate to show up on the internet. So that was kind of cool. No way, that's awesome. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, yeah. So you you kind of uh, set the law school and the, the the lawyering or the law aside to start focusing on your family and yes there seem from what we can gather that focusing on your family meant more than just the attention that you give to your kids it seemed like you were also expanding upon uh, the the food that you eat the things that you grow and how you grow them can you tell me a little bit about that whole philosophy of your life yes. I would love to. Um, You know, I really didn't think about it much until I got married to Scott. And he is a huge outdoorsman. And before we got married, he hunted every morning and every afternoon during hunting season. So we got married and then he, 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 cut it back to every um, morning and afternoon on the weekend. Um, and so that was still a little excessive. It took me a while to really um, love hunting because I felt like it was kind of, uh, you know, in my face. But I decided one day, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to embrace this and I'm going to cook this meat the best that I can because I can't cook anything else. Like anyway, I can't get anything, you know, to fit in my refrigerator or freezer. So I'm just you know, I'm going to embrace this. So I started really thinking about it and thinking how healthy that meat, you know, is. And it's organic. It's free range. It's totally, um, you know, free of of any antibiotics or, you know, anything. And it's just pure. So when I got to thinking about that, I wanted to add to that by, you know, making, having a vegetable garden. Then, you know, about that time I had toddlers and stuff and, and they, they were interested in going out and playing in the dirt. And I thought, you know, I'm going to raise them 
growing their own food. And I, I really did it more. We homeschooled. Um, we, we've homeschooled the entire time. You know, I, actually, I sent my my first one to kindergarten when he was four. And, and, and that was a disaster. I, I said, I'm never, never doing that again. So it's been part of our life, you know, is just to bring food to the table. And it's like everybody has a way to do that. You know, every all of our children have been a part of bringing food to the table. And it, it's given my kids confidence. So it's an emotional thing. And it's also a, 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 an idea of they know where food comes from and how valuable it is and how incredible it is that something grows from a seed, just a tiny little seed and, and grows up. And then you can save seeds from those things and then regrow those things next year. And the value is so, so, so special um, that we've been able to um, impart that into our kids and they all really love it. So that's been an interesting thing too. I mean, they don't hate, you know, doing the garden so gotcha. um and and they take part in bringing food to the table very cool it's, would you say that you're what they call a homesteader you know I, i've always yes i would say that but i've always kind of veered away from that word just because i, I always picture people that don't appreciate beauty so much being homesteaders that that it's just for um self-sufficiency which is huge I'm, I'm i love that and we are about that but i'm also about beauty and about um uh, beauty as well as functionality and I, I, I guess I, I want it all. You know, I want to be self-sufficient. I want to have the best food, but I also want it to be beautiful and I want to be creative. And, and I think it all goes back to that. Um, you know, to me, we we were created to create and I, I just find this part of creation amazing. And so it goes deeper than just, I think, being, you know, a homesteader. Okay. All right. I want to get into that whole idea, that concept that, that you just touched on in, in more depth and def, definitely want to bring Dusty in because I know he's got a deep interest in what's going on with uh, the, this this homesteader kind of concept. And it sounds like you're deeper than that. And I, don't, I want to kind of open up that a little bit more and find out more about your belief systems and, and how you yeah. go about your day-to-day operations. I kind of started off getting into homesteading and, and, you know, that style of life. Where did it all start for you uh, as far as uh, when you decided that you wanted to do that? I think that it was an accidental um, kind of thing. I, I never really set out to do this or to be a homesteader, but when you add one part of it, you know, first it all started with hunting and me, you know, kind of getting on the bandwagon and learning how to create wonderful recipes be, because I wanted really good food. I don't like to just eat food just for the fact of nourishment. I mean, I want it to taste good. I, I, I watch what I eat. And so what I do eat, I want it to taste great. So it all started for me just because I, I want a good flavor. I want a good food. And all we had to cook was deer meat because that's what my husband hunted. And that's what we had. And so for me, it was it was about that. But then it turned into the health thing. And then I started thinking, well, how much greater would fresh vegetables taste? So then we started a garden and we planted these fresh vegetables and, and it was for the flavor, for the taste, you know, for the food. And then I started thinking, but gosh, you know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm eating this, uh, this, uh, fresh meat that that's so pure i want to do that with my food too so i started planting heirloom seeds and you know seeds that have been around for generations and then it, it this is where the deeper part goes in and now my dad you know he he gardened i didn't live with him growing up um but he gardened and i guess i just maybe felt a connection with him there and he has begun giving me seeds that he's had for like 50 you know years and i think god that is so cool you know to be able to pass this down for generations and you know people pa pass uh furniture down and everything else why not seeds and so that was kind of cool and then we just added to that we you know my husband and boys wanted to um keep chickens well we're kind of dreamers anyway um we we invent things and and think about um 
new ideas all the time. So I just thought this was one of those passing ideas. And they got out outside and I heard all this racket going on and they were making a chicken tractor. And sure enough, a couple of days later, I had a phone call and it was the post office. And um, they were, it was six o'clock in the morning and they said, you have got a very loud package here. So I had to go to the post office, pick up the chickens. I didn't even know that they had, <laughs> you know, gotten them. So see, it's all accident right. <laughs> to me. And then we had to make a brooder, you know, to keep the chickens in. And um, every, we've, we've never looked back. I mean, it's been awesome having chickens. And then, you know, we thought, well, let's, you know, let's have honey. Let's, let's do bees. And, and you know, so my husband had a patient and they were beekeepers and they came and kind of tutored us in beekeeping. And that's the best way to do it, by the way, find somebody who's already gone before you and let them teach you. And it's so much easier. And then we learned how to do that. And so we added that to our program and we've got fruit trees and we plant um, collards for the deer and we eat the collards and, and it's just a circle of life kind of thing. It's, it's really, really neat. So um, that's kind of how it happened for us. Not only are you eating healthy, your food's tasting better, you're eating healthier. And, and, and far as the bees, the pollination, you know, and everybody says, oh, what's the bees got to do with deer hunting? Well, if you're, if you're, if you're planting fruit bearing trees on your farm that you're deer hunting without, Absolutely. Yeah, without pollination, you have nothing. How, how important is that, Stacey Lynn, that that pollination <sighs> takes place? Well, I, it is very, very, very important. And we have bees at our home. We ha we live um, on seven acres, which is not a whole lot of land. So we have like a, a kitchen garden, I would call it, although it's, it's pretty big, big in, in size. We have bees here. We also have them at our um, land. We have 150 acres out there. And the honey from those hives has a different taste. And I think, you know, we have our fruit trees. We have some fruit trees here um, at our property also, but we all, we, we experiment with different fruit trees. We even have kiwis this year. We decided we were going to go and, and try to do some kiwis, but the pollination is just so incredibly important so that we can keep growing things. I mean, if we don't have bees, we, we won't have food. So people really do need to keep bees. You know, we don't need to leave it for the big bee farmers. We need them locally. You know, we it, it's going to help produce better food. And then you get the honey. I mean, how what's golly, the best food ever, um, you know, for, for flavoring things and, and it lasts forever. It's preserved forever. Um, and it's so easy to keep. So, um, you know, I, it's, it's very important. Right. And, and, you know, you being uh, in the kitchen cooking a lot and that that's an important role for your food too. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And um, everything tastes better with honey. I mean, I make dressings and um, I, I, I make like slaw, um, slaw dressings, regular dressing. You can put it in um, muffins. I, I have a honey pie I like to make. I mean, you you just can make so many things using honey that it, and it just makes everything better. I mean, bread, man, you know, bread, it, 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 there's a whole different texture and flavor when you cook with honey. As far as maintenance and upkeep on a beehive, like let, let's say if somebody's looking to get into a beehive to put on a fruit bearing farm on some trees that they have, uh, what's the maintenance and, and the upkeep on a beehive? That's something that, you know, a question that I've always had, because I'm interested in bees myself, but somebody that's looking to put them on a farm, how much maintenance it's, and upkeep goes into a beehive? You know, I had somebody ask me that just today. They they private messaged me on um on Facebook and hey, in, anybody I'm on all social media, Stacy Lynn Harris. Look me up if you have any questions or you know anything. You know, like me, follow me, and 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 I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Um. If I know the answer and if I don't, I'll go look it up, look it up or figure it out. Um, but it's really not that big of a deal. Getting started is a bigger deal than actually maintaining your hives. Um, if you don't have any trouble with moths, um, and I, I have had that. I've had wax moths in the past, and that is just a terror. One day your hive is functioning great, and then you go outside and you have this, there's this strange smell to your hive, and the smell lets you know something's wrong. And and we looked in, and, and you know, the, the bees are so great at keeping 
the hive neat. And if anything's ever dripping or you see any any honey coming out of the hive, you know something is wrong. Some moths had gotten in there, but they won't overtake a healthy hive. But depending on if there's too many bees or some bees leave or if the queen dies, I mean, there's so many things that can go wrong um, that, you know, will cause your hive to weaken. But if you've got a strong hive and, a, and, and your your queen, you know, is good and all, you really don't have to go out but maybe once a week to check that hive to make sure that it's you know, doing okay. And in the winter months when things are not blooming, uh, you there's different, people say different things, but we usually will give our bees some sugar water and making sure that they have plenty to eat to keep them healthy until this, the season comes, you know, to where they're pollinating in the uh, fields and, and in your garden. So um, it's really, there's just not that much to do. Once your hive is up and running, you just check it, make sure the bees are okay, make sure your queen's okay. If all is well in a couple of months, you will get an extruder and you can rent those from like a, a local bee hive association for $5. Get an extruder, extruder and um, get your honey and extrude it. We, we got 10, 10, um, Oh God, I can't. I think it was like ten gallons off the first season of honey. But we had we had a lot of hives at that time, mm. um, and it was incredible. And the honey was so good. So um, it's definitely worth it. But you know there is an an initial investment at the beginning. Right. That makes so I, I talk about it in my book. Um, I, my latest book is called Harvest, and um, and I talk about honey and hives in the book. Gotcha. Not to uh, be going to different subjects, but we, when you got into gardening of a, on a homestead and you're raising your own uh, vegetables and things of that nature, how much uh, area of, of land did, did you use to get your garden going? And where, where is it at today? Well, we lived in Birmingham at the time and um, we didn't have a very big house or anything. We were, you know, poor students. And so but we did have a, a little house and we had about a half an acre. And so we were able to have a, a pretty decent sized garden. Now, when we moved back to Montgomery, we didn't, we didn't have a very big yard, but you can garden in pots. I mean, people can, can garden on their back porches. You can grow something. You may not be able to, you know, have a, uh, what, what people would say a true homestead and, and have peas and squash and, you know, cantaloupe and watermelon, you may not be able to have all of that. Those are divining ones that take up so much room, but you could do, um, you know, you could do tomatoes and you could do some eggplant. You could do, you know, you could put those around your home, you know, and make it really beautiful. So depending on where you live, I mean, I would tell anybody just get started where you are. I mean, even if you live in an apartment, you know, do herbs and, and I, I have like a the idea of a of a um an italian type um pot where you've got basil and oregano and or, or oregano as the british would say um and then you've got your tomato plant in the middle and you know any time you know whatever all and just all in one pot and you know cook italian all summer long and just use that so you know, but right now we have about, I would say a quarter of an acre planted. It's not really that much, but it's plenty for our family. And I have seven children. So seven kids, my husband and me, and we, um, we eat great, you know, and, and we're able to, you know, get a lot out of that. Oh yeah. And it's gotta, it's gotta make your cooking. And as far as, you know, getting into the venison and and oh, yeah. for that it's it's got to be very flavorful to to mix in the fresh veggies and, and herbs and whatever else that you're going to use for your events and dishes it's got to make a difference it does and it with it being so fresh then we get to choose too you know like every year and i think i've even got some youtubes on this um but every year we'll just choose what's our favorite like tomato and then that next year you know we will plant more of those or our favorite pepper or, you know, the like purple whole peas. And, you know, we'll, we'll decide what things are so great, you know, which variety do we like the best? And it's kind of, it's just real fun for us to do that. 
and we all write it, write it down and it's kind of, and it's neat to see that we all have the same, we all usually end up having the same thought on it. So that it's real fun for the family to do that. If you, if you had one, uh, vegetable or herb to, to plant for making a venison meal, what would it be? Wow. Well, that's really hard because to me, I mean, I, man, I can think of so many things and tomatoes are always, they come to mind first. I'm going to Texas in, at the beginning of May and I'm going to make Parmesan venison. And it is absolutely one of my favorite things to make. And it's, there's a simple sauce just a red sauce or a tomato sauce. And it's in both of my books. I put it in both of them because it's my favorite sauce ever. And I have to, you know, I have to have it. So it's the base of so many dishes. And so happy, healthy family tracking the outdoors in and my harvest cookbook and then recipes and tips for sustainable living. They, they have that recipe in there and it's really easy to make, but that would be one. But then I also think of um, things like hummus and I use eggplant for that. And so when I, you know, eggplant would be great. And sometimes I like to do um, squash noodles and not have the, you know, red regular pasta. And so squash would be, I, I, there's no way I could ever say which one, you know, I would prefer because they're all so good. And it depends on that year, what has produced really well. So I guess it would be different every year Getting hungry, and every season, because think about, yeah. you know, in the fall, you know, the cabbage and you can do cabbage rolls with that, mm. or you could do a cabbage soup with, um, you know, turkey or, or venison um, meatballs in it. I mean, there's just, it, the sky's the limit. Full, full blown garden. That's what you need. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If, right. if you can do it and if you can't, you know, there's other things you can do. I mean, I have a, an herb salad. Um, also, like in my um, in this last book, latest book, the Harvest Cook book, I've got an herb salad that has a balsamic vinaigrette, and it it it's amazing. And I just use herbs pretty much for the whole salad. I mean, it, it's got greens in it, but you've also got your herbs, and then in your balsamic vinaigrette, you've got herbs in that, and you can cook with edible flowers. And I have impatiens in the salad and it makes it really beautiful and it tastes delicious. And you could put wild turkey in it or you could, you know, uh, fry up some goat cheese and which would be really cool if you have goats, which I think you do, um, have goats. Didn't you mention that a minute ago? Yep. Sure do. So that is cool. And so goat's milk, um, making goat cheese, goat's cheese and, and, and then you just fry it up with panko. Oh my gosh. That stuff is like to die for. Mm, very good. Really good. Let's get in some venison preparation and cooking and all of that great stuff. Right now, I'm going to holler upstairs and have my wife bring down something to eat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very cool. So we we kind of gave an overview of, of you know the what goes through your household and where it comes from and and the philosophy behind it. I want to get into some more specifics, maybe some recipes that you could walk us through. Um, okay. For each of those categories, quickly. Let's start with like a, a wild game. Now you're you hang out with Scott Lasath, the, the sporting yeah. chef, right? You're you're doing yeah. some co-hosting with him on the yeah, show. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. So yeah. what, what what's Scott like behind the scenes? I mean, is is he a good guy? Oh yeah, yeah. He's um he's the same behind the scenes as he is on TV. I mean, pretty much exactly the same. So yeah. um you know what you see is what you get. He's really great and comes down and films. We have a blast. We nice. just have a blast. Very cool. It's really fun. Let's talk about some venison dishes. Uh, maybe you can walk us through a couple of those. I, I think, to me, and and and, and the th you can do anything with venison. Okay. Um, that you can do with beef, but it has to be done completely different because um, because they're so different. You know, you've got the marbling in beef that you don't have with venison. So. With the loin, I, I really like to cook it to like a medium rare. So I always just, I love steaks with that. So I will put a, um, now the tenderloin, I have a wonderful, wonderful recipe where I roll it in coffee. I know that's kind of strange. And coffee, but, like ground um, coffee kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Coffee. Right. Um, and, it, and it's called cocoa crusted venison. And it's like, it's coffee with a little bit of um, unsweetened chocolate, you know, like the, the powder. Mm -hmm. kind with some salt and pepper 
And then, you know, in a really hot skillet and brown the sides, and this is the tenderloin, so the little small piece, and so it doesn't take but probably five minutes for the entire thing and on, you know, going on each side, making sure that it's good and brown. And then I make a blueberry or a, a blueberry blackberry kind of mixture, depending, you know, on what I've got, and um, put a little bit of sugar in that, put a little bit of wine in it, reduce that down and, and put that on top of that tenderloin, that cocoa crusted tenderloin. Oh my goodness. It is so good. And I have it over collard greens mm. or um, spinach, you know, some kind of greens and something really light and refreshing. And, oh, it is just amazing. So you really need to try that. Oh. I know it's a weird combination, but it is so good. All right. And wh- where are you cooking this? In an oven? On a grill? No, oh, on okay. top of the um, on top of the stove okay. in a cast iron skillet. Gotcha. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Uh-huh. That, that makes sense. And yeah. How, how long do you cook it for? How long does it usually take? It? Um, About five minutes for the loin. And then I reduce the sauce. Now I'll do it in a saucepan. I reduce the sauce. It is just really, really great. Now the, the reduce, reducing the sauce, I usually will reduce it probably for 15 minutes. So you're talking pretty fast. This, And if you got spinach and you put it in a saute pan and you just put a little olive oil, salt and pepper in there and just reduce it down. I mean, you know, let, let it sweat um, out, put a little, maybe sweat some onions in there with it, little bitty minced onions, maybe a little garlic. Yeah. And that's all. I mean, you're done. I mean, 20 minutes for this whole meal. Wow. So it is, um, it, it is like, and really you feel like it's a gourmet meal. I mean, it is just so good. So for the, the bigger loin, the, um, backstrap, mm-hmm. I like to do the same thing pretty much, but, but not, I, I usually would just do salt and pepper and maybe a dry rub, or I might marinate it, um, depending on what I want. And I will just, you know, brown the outside and then stick it in the oven on, you know, 350 for about 15 minutes so that it's medium rare and then cut it into steak size pieces and serve it with garlic mashed potatoes and um, uh, green beans or asparagus or salad. Or you can pound those pieces out for the tender, most tender, um, just yeah, beer fried steak. Oh my right, gosh! Right, right. I was that is uh, yeah, Dusty's. You've done that before, Dusty, haven't you? You send me the pictures of your your uh, deer fried steaks. Oh, I love it. Yeah, it's, it's oh, phenomenal. So Every good. time he sends me the picture, I mean, he ha- he has he has lots of it in his in his uh, freezer usually over the years, and he's always teasing me by sending yes. me pictures of fresh, his, <laughs> his dinner. Fresh lard. I know. I start this out with it's fresh so lard. Good. I dip my yeah. uh, dip my deer steaks and uh, a little bit of seasoning, uh, garlic herb, and some flour mix. Mm. Right in a steak, they in the the lard they go, and you know get them nice and you know the, they get crispy on the exterior, but the insides moist and you know. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, just yeah. a little touch better than medium rare. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so three. good. Is oh. that just so good? I know. Oh. I want some of that now. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Good. And, you know, you can do that with the hind quarter, too. You can do that with, um, you know, if you cut it thin enough and, and pound it out, it's got a lot more uh, a lot more cartilage and, and connective tissue and, you know, and all. But, um, but it's so, so, so good. And another thing that I like to do with, and people don't think about doing this, but with my hind quarter, I will, um, or the roast, meat instead of cooking it like a roast i really don't like it as a roast unless you cook it like at 139 degrees and that's really low and i don't think that a slow cooker even gets that low but i like to split that uh hind quarter into three pieces like horizontally does that make sense just across horizontally and then pound those pieces out or cut those or take those pieces then put your seasoning on the outside of that and then brown it in a skillet just until it gets brown on both sides. Then take it off, let it rest for about 10 minutes and then cut it into slices. And I will eat on that like for a couple of days and you can put it in salads. You can put it in fajitas. Um, you can put it, you know, in a pasta dish. Um, you can do all kinds of things with that one, you know, one idea. Okay. Um, you yeah. say you just take a roast and cut it in three chunks and, and simmer it? 
You don't simmer it, um, but yes, you take a roast and you can cut it. Depending on how big, how big it is, make mm-hmm. your pieces or your slices, and they'll be big, big slices, and then just browning it. And then when you slice through it against the grain, you'll get strips. You'll just get like little strips of meat, just like fajita fajita meat, um, you know, that you think about. But it's medium rare, so it's not all the way cooked through. Right. And you can just, you know, put it in the refrigerator, get it out, um, put it in your pasta or put it in your salad or your fajitas. So I don't know if that makes any sense, but I do that on my, if you watch my YouTube channel, you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay. It's making sense and making me hungry. Yes, it is. Yes. Good. I hope that makes sense. (laughs) I'm 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 like, I want it to make sense so bad because the toughest cut of meat, as long as it's sliced thin against the grain is going to be tender. It's kind of like using, um, if people are not used to deer meat, it, you, you know, I like to describe that cut, what I'm talking about, as a skirt steak. So even in my book, in, in my book called um, Harvest and Recipes for Tips um, for Sustainable Living, I have a section in there that's a substitution list. And I will tell you what cut of meat to use if you don't cook with venison, you know, just in case there's people that don't use it. And skirt steak is is the piece that I would, you know, tell you to use for these recipes. And skirt steak, just like venison, has more flavor than really most of the cuts of meat, right. even though they might be more tender. The flavor comes from that that connective tissue and muscle fiber that that melts together and, and, and forms that wonderful, rich collagen flavor. That makes complete sense to me. I always felt like the skirt steak was just just vibrant with, with yes. flavors of all sorts that you don't get necessarily in some of the other cuts. Even though, for for whatever reason, we've decided that the 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 other cuts that are somewhat popular, we've been told have more flavor in in some ways, but I don't think they do. I don't think so. I don't think so. You don't get the full flavor of the meat. I don't. I don't know what it, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that the other cuts are as flavorful. They, they maybe because they are flavored um, with some spices or, or, you know, salt and pepper and the, in the fat absorbs it a little bit more. Right. Maybe that's where people are, are seeing the right. flavor, but from the meat itself, you know, it's those um, cuts that, that don't have all that fat that yep. really, you know, give you the flavor. So I'm thinking, Stacey Lynn, that we need to have you on our live show that we do on Thursdays, which is all video produced instead of audio. And we need to do a little cooking show with you. What do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. I I couldn't agree with that more. But man, I sure would like to taste what she's cooking now. My (laughs) God. Maybe we'll fly to Alabama and do the live show with you. Yes. That would be even better. And then we get to eat too. That's right. That's right. That would be so much fun. And I'm looking at one of my recipes in the book. It just kind of opened to this page, but it's roasted lamb with smashed roasted potatoes and garlic. The the smashed roasted potatoes, uh, those are so good. And I have to tell you about those um, because they'll go with venison so well. But they're little new potatoes and I, I boil them. Then put them on a cookie sheet on parchment paper Mm -hmm. and smash them with the palm of your hand. And then put olive oil on top of that and then salt and pepper and like rosemary or whatever, whatever, you know, herb you've got, whatever you want. Put them in the oven for, uh, you know, at 350 for like about 15 minutes and it gets it really crunchy, Mm -hmm. you know, on the edges and all that smashed, you know, the edges of all that where you smashed it out. And just wonderful and tender and creamy on the inside of those. And it's just absolutely amazing. That that flavor yeah. is crazy great with um with venison or um you know, your chickens. Now we we haven't talked about, you know, you have chickens too, and you know, a lot of people don't like that you eat those chickens, and I don't know about you, but we have eaten, you know, several of ours. Is that a bad thing to say? <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, you know, we, we, we kill what we eat on this show. That's yeah, right. that's what I so thought. That's okay. exactly right. So <laughs> that's that's fascinating. Now you're so you have an ample supply of, of venison from from your husband. You got plenty of venison to pick from. Oh yeah. The well, they usually get about thirteen 
deer a year between them all. Okay. So, yeah. Very nice. Can we go back to the garden a little bit? I wanted to touch base on, and you said that you sit around the, the table and, and come up with what you want to put in your garden. Can you kind of go through what's in your garden now, or, or maybe it's not even planting season in Alabama? I know you're, It is. Okay. It is. We actually just planted okay. our garden. Good Friday here in the South is a tradition to plant. We planted tomatoes. Well, we, we planted from seed about six weeks ago, maybe a little longer. Um, tomatoes, peppers, and an eggplant. Okay. And so we they grew up into, you know, nice size nice size plants. And once we hardened them off, you know, by putting them outside for um, a, a couple of weeks, you know, to, to get used to the outdoors, we planted them in the garden. And so we have those planted and okay. we also planted some of our peas and we'll be planting okra soon, but it's not quite time to plant okra yet. And we've got garlic already growing out there it takes a pretty long time and then we've got onions they're already growing and so we have some bunch onions and then you know you have to let the garlic dry so we'll braid our garlic when when we harvest it and we'll let it dry and it's delicious and you know we're not harvesting anything right now except strawberries now strawberries and my herbs are growing really great uh right now too okay so rosemary and oregano is doing really wonderful and I've got one of my daughters wanted to do a uh, a garden with flowers, too. So we've got a, a flower bed out. I've got a couple of raised beds around, too. And so we gave her one of those raised beds. And so she's planting whatever she wants to in that. Okay. And it looks real good. And it's kind of neat to see your kids design. I, you know, and, you know, one of one. My daughter, that's seven, she wanted her own garden, so that's the one that we gave it to. And then my son, which just turned 16 today, um, he went out there, and he he was like, you need to put all of that color on this side. Anyway, he had his opinion. And so we're real opinionated people. So (laughs) we, we, we don't mind telling each other what we think. So it's real interesting you know, to be a part of, of this family. So anyway, um, so that was really, really fun. But, but those are some of the things that we have right now. Okay. And yeah. So that's your layout in your garden. Now let's go, let's go a little deeper and talk about the seeds themselves. Do you get, being of the, the homestead concept, do you go and, and pick out a certain kind of seeds or are there certain seeds you won't plant based off of where they were grown or how they were produced or things like that? I like heirloom seeds. Now, hybrids are fine. I don't have a problem with hybrids. I do not like the seeds that have GMOs or that are, you know, I, for a lot of reasons. I mean, political reasons, you know, would be one because I don't I don't like that somebody owns a patent on a seed. Um, and, and I feel like that in a way it, it kind of takes your freedom away because they don't want you to replant those, especially big farmers have gotten in a lot of trouble for for you know, replanting the seed have anyway, they don't produce once you replant it, or if they do, they are not like the original seed to begin with. They will, they will be patterned after either the mother or father plant. And so they won't even reproduce the way that that came about that year. So I like heirloom seeds and I think they grow best here or, or in, you know, because what an heirloom seed does, it always comes back better in your environment. It kind of adapts itself to your environment and you get a better plant. And and the more you plant it every year, the better it gets because you save the seeds from your favorite plants. Okay. So you're so, actually saving the seeds as the plants die off and you're saving some of that to replant in future years. That's right. Years. That's right. And some of the seeds that I started off with, I got from my dad. Some of them, you know, they ha- that I've got from, you know, friends or I would order them, you know, off the internet from a reputable source. There's a Baker's Creek. I don't know if you've heard of them, but um, seed company. And I like Southern Exposure because they have more of the things that we grow here. Okay. And I also like to plant things that grow well in my soil. So some things just, you know, don't 
really do that well. So I don't want to plant those and I see what they are and I, I don't repent. And the first year that we had a garden, and, and I always like to tell people this because people think they don't have a green thumb, but the first time we planted a garden, I went to Walmart and I just thought any seeds were, I mean, seeds were seeds. And so sure. I got those seeds planted them and and I was very disappointed and you know I I didn't get anything I thought god I'm just a terrible gardener but it, it's it, it you know the seeds can be old and um I, I, t- I like to tell people to go to your co-op and if they're fresh seeds ask them about you know when did you get these seeds you know where do they come from and if they're you know good and fresh and they're made for your area they should do really well so um gotcha. yeah that's that's really good to know because you know, as I think the the planting season obviously kind of starts in the south. If you look at as the winter just starts to disappear, starting from the south going north, as you're starting, as you just planted, we'll be planting in the northern region in, in about a month or so. I know. It, it's yeah. so funny because I, on my blog, I, a lot of times I plan what I'm going to be doing and, you know, and I'm basing it on the South. And then I think, golly, but what about the people, you know, in the North, they're, they're, they're getting snow still. So, you know, so I'm like, I kind of hold off and, and do it in the middle. We plant stuff so early here and like lettuce grows all year here. So, you know, there's things that do grow all the time here that you, that other people won't be able to get. It's just a whole different world than what I live in. I mean, we had, we, our snow disappeared last week for the first time. And wow. So it's been a long winter, though not particularly cold, but it it definitely affects growing season. In fact, I just, I just uh, created a new uh, raised bed with a bunch of rocks that I I laid out last year and I filled it with some good soils that I had mixed over at a, at a local garden center. Yeah. So, yeah. So th- that that brings me to another uh, point in concept. Okay, so you've got you know you planned out what you're going to grow, then you made sure that you bought your seeds from a particular place that has a particular uh, protocol in the way they're treated. Let's go into your soils a little bit. We've we've learned a little bit about soils on this show from from talking to to different people doing food plots for deer, for example. We never really right. talked to the gardener. How do you right. what, how do you go about prepping your your garden maybe it's the same kind of concept but what do you look for in your soils are you doing ph testing like we've we've learned and you know when we're talking mm-hmm. about food plots but how what goes into your soil what are you looking for and what do you add to it or, or subtract from it and it's uh, really about the same thing as a food plot um and and it, you know your ph it, it it does have to be right and that is a huge part of it and yeah we do we do that and see we're we're lucky we have um auburn university which is an agriculture school oh, wow. it's very it's very close by and so they test people's soil all the time and i don't know if they get their students to do it or what but it it costs like six dollars i think um and we don't do it every year but we'll do it every couple of years to make sure that nothing you know bad is going on we also have a compost bin and um in fact we spread some compost out today um over our or not right up next to the right up next to the plants not on them but next to the plants and so we have that going all year long um and and you know and i don't know if you know this or not but if you put um a deer carcass in a very good compost bin that the 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 compost post is warm and you know it's got the microbes that it's supposed to have mm-hmm. it'll decompose in two weeks really yeah it it is crazy yes so um that's kind of cool and so yeah so is we, that like I, a I, test of your compost like is it doing is, is it a good test for like the microbes that are in there is it working correctly to throw a carcass yeah in? and i mean we're not the one thing i've learned in in gardening and in raising kids and just in life is that nothing's ever going to be textbook um and it's okay to do things different and not to freak out when things are not exactly right as I, I kind of like things to be perfect and um, I have to let go of that. And so I don't know that, that my compost pile is ever absolutely perfect, but yeah, I mean, if you, there are some things that you can look at to see, and I, I don't stress out about it if, if it isn't decomposing, right. But yeah, it would be a good test 
you know, for for a bin. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Let's uh, let's talk about your cookbooks a little bit that you've written. Can you kind of go through some of the cookbooks that you've put together and the concepts behind them and why you decided to do cookbooks for others in the first place? Yes. Um, well, the first one had been, you know, in my mind for a really long time. And we were in Tennessee and, you know, we were visiting some people. And my husband said, you know, I think it's about time that you write that cookbook. And I thought, well, OK. So on the way back to um, back home, by the time we got here from Tennessee, which I think is a five hour drive, um, I already had an entire outline and knew exactly what I was going to do. And three months later, I had the book together. So, um, that was all of my very favorite recipes that I wanted to share with everyone. And that had to do really with wild game and fresh vegetables. And I did have, there are a few of my grandmother's desserts in there. And that is the tracking the outdoors in, um, cookbook and it's happy, healthy family tracking the outdoors in. And I love that cookbook. I go to it even now, my kids will go to it and look up certain things. And, um, it's just basic recipes and some really, really great ones using venison i've got appetizers and i've got i mean and turkey i've got wild turkey i've got pheasant i've got you know quail and different things in there as well um but i've also got like uh like carrots caramelized carrots and uh asparagus baked asparagus i mean just some simple really really great recipes um and then recipes and tips for sustainable living um it's got uh, some how to's and it's got some really good solid recipes in it. And I was asked um, by a company to write that cookbook and it um, it's, it's a good cookbook. I mean, it's got some really, really good stuff in it. And that one led me to write Stacy Lynn's Harvest cookbook. And I kind of got that cookbook to, um, and added, I kind of re- revamped that particular cookbook and used some of the same things for my harvest cookbook, but I added a lot of my southern favorites like fried okay. green tomatoes and um, and jalapeno poppers, some basic things, but but that are amped up a little bit. And I also made them a little bit more healthy by putting some baked things like baked fried green tomatoes, baked um, jalapeno poppers, and they have bacon and cheddar and cream cheese in the filling. Man, it is so good. You cannot imagine. And I put um, some chicken, some lamb, some basic um, recipes along with like my award, you know, chili con carne recipe, which has venison in it. And did you know that um, Teddy Roosevelt would not eat chili without venison? That was a neat, neat little tidbit I learned. Is that right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and I've got like a stuffed meatloaf, and I've got a lot of great fish recipes, and um, and and like slow cooker pheasant nachos, and you know, but I've, I've oh, I did do see that chili cocoa crusted venison with berry reduction in in my Stacy Lynn's Harvest Cookbook. So, if anybody wants to know, it's okay. in that one. Gotcha. So, um. So, yeah, so that's kind of, and I have a lot of how-tos, like how to make your own sausage, deer sausage, how to um, boil the perfect egg, you know, how to do a vertical garden, how to save seeds. I've got a lot of how-tos in my cookbooks. Okay, very cool. I'm I'm on your blog right now, and I'm staring at the braised short ribs, and they are speaking to me loud and clear. Yes, and they're so easy. Wow. They're just so easy. So, um, yes, and that's in the cookbook as well. Braised short ribs with a ginger grimolata, which sounds really elegant. And all it is is um, just parsley and, you know, lemon, um, the, the lemon rind or zest um, and ginger, you know, and all mixed together really nicely. And that's all it is. But it adds so much flavor to the ribs. Wow. This uh this this blog is very cool. So I'm gonna have to come back and hang out here. And I don't know if I told you, Stacy Lynn, but my wife is actually a trained chef. She, oh my gosh, so, no. Yes. So how I, awesome is that? It is an awesome life, I have to admit. It's it's fantastic. And see I got smart. I, I, when when we were not married and didn't have kids, I I said, Where do you what do you want to do with your life? So I wanna be a chef. So we'll go find a culinary school and go. 
So she did. Wow. And so my, I mean, just, just the wool, just boiled water tastes better now. It's fantastic. Yeah. Wow. I tell you what, and you know, I love that. I love that you, you wanted her to be the best her that she could be. I think that is so cool. I mean, you know, not, not everybody is that way. And I hope that I'm, I'm raising my kids to help somebody become a better person. Right. So it's made my life much better. I can tell you that. Uh, just, yeah, I bet. Yeah. So, the, you know, the, it wasn't, wasn't all just me being generous. There was some, some selfishness. There, <laughs> there was a reason there behind was a it. a reason, yes. Um, <laughs> so the, it, it's worked out well. I'm going to show her your site. I think she's going to really enjoy it. Uh, she just loves stuff like this and. We're, 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 well, thank you. We're looking forward to planting our garden now, and you gave me some great ideas for sure. Yes, yes. Well, good. All right. So before we started talking about the the, the concepts of how you live your life, we we talked a little bit about a deer story, and you said that you you don't hunt much, but that you actually had a deer hunting story to tell. And I'd like to get into that right now, if we could. Yeah, that sounds great. Well, okay. Well, the first. And only deer I have ever taken. I was actually on a television show. It was that um, deer and deer hunting TV? Sure. Um, yeah. yeah. And so I, did the whole show, it was, it was, it was awesome. It really was an incredible experience. So I went hunting, and I wasn't sure if I really felt comfortable, you know, shooting a deer. Um, you know, that's all that had always been up to my husband. And I never, it, it, you know, I went hunting with him. And even when we were dating, I went duck hunting and, and I went dove hunting, but I like to read a lot. So I pretty much read the whole time we were, you know, dove hunting. He'd be sure. getting them. I'm like, did you get any? Well, anyway, you know, I thought, okay, I'm going to give this a try and see what it's all about. And see, you know, I wanted to see the whole experience of where your food comes from. Got up in the tree stand went to this great place and and I was there with another group of guys there that wanted that were was hunting they were hunting for a TV show too this is a great place to go hunting and actually it was Ray Scott's place I don't know if you know sure. um yeah. Ray Scott okay yeah, Ray Scott. so they put me next to a road and in, in this area that I you know they wanted me to get a doe they were thinking you know well maybe some does will come out in this spot. There was a road. It was right up next to, you know, um, a, a kind of a noisy area. So I sat in the thing and I thought, you know, well, am I going to, do I really want to shoot one? I, I kept questioning that. But then I thought, well, if a deer, you know, walks to the right here and I had a particular spot that I wanted the deer to walk to, then I will shoot it. There was a deer out. It was a small spike. It wasn't a real small spike, but you know, and I think they were wanting me, I was, they were questioning whether I should shoot that or not. Cause I asked them, you know, do you want me to shoot it? Do you not? And it, it wasn't in the spot that I wanted it to be in. So when I looked up, there was, while they were, while the guy that was with me filming was calling back to say, Hey, is it okay if she shoots the spike um, for the show? I, I looked up and it was like, all of a sudden I heard angels singing. I mean, I didn't really, but, um, but it was like, <laughs> La, you know, and this <laughs> halo over and it was raining and I, I had only been in the stand for like five minutes and this huge buck, it was like an eight point buck and it was amazing. And it lifted its head and it was right. Exactly. Not the head, but the body in the spot that I said, well, if something walks right there, then that is meant for me. And it was like this ray of sun, you know, coming down on this animal. And so I shot it and, you know, and, and got it. And it was, it was a beautiful, wonderful experience. And I, you know, I'm so thankful that I had that experience, but I've never really wanted to do it again. So I don't know. Um, you know, I, I love cooking them. I, I love seeing them. I love photographing the beautiful animals and I love eating them. Um, but you know, but I haven't really, you know, haven't gotten into, I didn't get the, the, I guess I got the buck fever when I killed it, but I, I don't, I don't really have that buck fever all the time. So. Well, I think yeah, it's so pretty cool that, that that you had a chance to shoot a nice eight point buck. Not many people. Oh yeah, that. I know. And when we we got back to um, you know, back to the place, and they were saying, "Well, now who got it?" And you know, they they came back and they had been there like for a week trying to get something, and they weren't, they had not done it. And so I think they were a little bit upset that I had <laughs> that I had that opportunity. Right. Right. So, but it, it was good. Well, that's it awesome. Really good. All right. Very good, dear story. I appreciate that. So, yeah. Dusty, you want to do the 10 rapids? 
Yeah, well, I sure can. Okay. Absolutely. And, and, you know, Stacey, then we haven't uh, prepped you for these in any way. And uh, these are questions. No, you haven't. Good, good, you don't good know luck. what you're going to get. Good luck, Stacey Lynn. Okay, thank you. <laughs> What's your, we know you haven't hunted much, but what's your, what would be your, your number one hunting tip? Oh, um, hmm. okay. If you hunt with a muzzle loader, don't, don't take it in the rain. Gotcha. Perfect tip. One, <laughs> one thing that if you had a lucky charm or, or something that you carry with you at all time is what, what could you not go into the woods to hunt without? Um, hmm. My locket with my family in it. Awesome. What's your biggest pet peeve in life? Oh, gosh. Oh, man. Um, wow. Gosh, that's a tough one. Um, I, you know, probably, wow. I don't know. Dry, um, slow. Do other people have trouble like this? <laughs> yeah, yes, they do. <laughs> yep. Oh, my yep. goodness. Um, probably, uh, I mean, you know, probably people being really, really slow. Um, you know, like, you know, maybe slow driving. I don't know, but you know, yeah, probably that. Okay. Well, that, that makes sense. Perfect. <laughs> what would the, what would the Stacy Lynn of today tell the 20 year old Stacy Lynn knowing what you know? Oh, today? oh yeah. Um, I would say, um, n- just to completely not worry and, and, and walk in the moment and enjoy life. Um, you know, I don't think too, too much. Perfect. You meet a stranger at, let's say, a cooking expo or some kind of outdoor show, and they ask what you do for a living. What do you say? Oh, um, raise kids and write, you know, raise kids, uh, take care of a husband, and write about it. Very good. What did you have for breakfast this morning? I don't eat breakfast. <laughs> you don't eat breakfast. You have all the stuff, and you don't eat breakfast. I don't. I don't. I, I, okay. I, I have to save my calories. So I, I, I start eating around 11 o'clock, you know, and, and, and it's usually lunch of some kind. Right on. You get your own billboard, a blank canvas on the side of the road, wherever. What would it say on that blank canvas? Um, to rejoice always. Very good. I know that sounds crazy, but... I think that half of our problems would go away if we could walk in joy. And I know that life is really hard, but, um, but I think if we can concentrate, you know, on, on being joyful, even in the really hard times, I think that testimony to our kids speaks volumes. Very good. I say the word successful. Who's the first person that pops in your mind and why? Mm. Y'all, these are kickers. Yeah, these are tough. Um, yeah, they are. I mean, I, I think I would say my husband and uh, Scott, and I think the reason why is that he is able to, you know, he, he heard, a, a guy told him one time to not, to you work to, you work to live, you don't live to work. And he has lived by that and he has enjoyed his family more than most men enjoy their families and he he knows what he wants and he lives that way very good what's a day in your life look like oh my um every day looks absolutely different so that's really hard to say Mm -hmm. um i I, you know actually one one day i asked my husband i said well you know i don't feel like i can accomplish all of this i have so much to do there is no way that i can do this how do you think that i should set my day up and he said well every day is going to look different to you. And, um, and it really does, but for a normal day, I guess, you know, if you really want to know, I get up, um, and I, you know, I, I have a quiet time with the Lord because if I don't, I'll be crazy. And then I get my day planned at that point of what three things are important for my husband, what three things are important for the kids, what three things are important for my business and the house. And then, um, I start working at it. And since we homeschool, I usually teach the kids for a couple of hours and then start on that list. And so it may be laundry, it may be cooking. I mean, you know, that's always part of it. Um, but a lot of it is just, um, telling people what to do. Um, you know, the kids so that all of the things that have to happen in the house happen. And then, um, I, I, you know, I usually spend a couple of hours a day, you know, either writing or answering emails or, you know, doing interviews or, you know, whatever, 
um, uh, doing social media, uh, whatever has to be done that day. So, and I usually work until probably nine at night. So it's a long day. Yeah, that, that is a long day for sure. You say you go hunting with your husband. What does a hunting day in your life look like? Um, I don't really go that much anymore, but when, you know, early on I did, and we would go, um, we would go duck hunting or something um, exciting. I, I don't much like to sit still, so <laughs> it has to be where we, <laughs> where we're doing something, you know, where where we're actually walking or, or um, you know, you you can kind of walk a little bit turkey hunting. You got to do it real quiet, but um, and so I'll do that. But for the most part, I I just let him go. And, and I just cook it up when he gets back. And, and I'm real happy when he doesn't take pictures. I take lots of pictures. Very good. Well, that completes the 10 rapid fire questions. That's it. You made it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Very cool. I'm Excellent. sure that I have a better pet peeve, but I'd have to give that some thought. All right. If you, if you think of it, you let us know. I'll do that. I'll do that. All right. So if we w- wanted to check check more of your stuff out, like your blog and where to buy cookbooks and uh, contact you, where would we go for that? Gameandgarden.com. And I also have another website, StacyLynnHarris.com. But um, I, I mostly post on Gameandgarden.com. You can buy cookbooks from me if you want them signed. If not, um, you can buy them from Amazon. The price fluctuates. Sometimes they have great sales. Uh, and you can social media is Stacy Lynn Harris on Instagram, Twitter, um, and, uh, Facebook. So, um, on all of those. And so just check me out in any of those areas and I'll be more than happy. You can email me at gameandgarden.com. Gameandgarden.com. I I think we're following you on every platform you have, but I'm going to go through and just double check. Uh, Yay. uh, That's excellent. And leave me a review. I I, I love for y'all to leave me a review. Um, if you like the book, um, on Amazon. Okay. Yeah, we will definitely Uh do that. But yes, I will. I'll uh, have to get you a book. I'll go through this. That would be awesome. That would be very nice. I'd like to give that to my wife. Actually. I think she'd really enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Excellent. This has been really fun talking yes, about this this whole concept of you know growing your own food and and and, and cooking up some um, amazing uh, free range organic meats and and how you go about it and I love what you're doing the lifestyle and your blog it's it's really fascinating and it's it's an interesting read just talking to you tonight and going through and reading about some of the stuff as we're talking um, I really think you have some good stuff going on very very good I'd love to hear from everybody I certainly enjoyed that conversation with Stacey Lynn Harris, and it was definitely something different than what we usually cover. Just a different aspect of of everything that uh, is out there when it comes to free-range organic meats and what other things can come of that and uh, lifestyles that might be surrounding that. So uh, thanks to Stacey Lynn Harris for joining us and telling us about her life in Alabama. Also wanted to say thank you to our sponsors, Advanced Takedown Tree Stands, Covert Scouting Cameras, the Horny Buck Seed Company, the Euro Hanger, and Morse's Sporting Goods. And truly, guys, all those products that are making this show possible, all those sponsors that are making this show possible, are truly products we get behind. We use them. We like them. They're high-quality products. And please, I would encourage you that if you are thinking about buying any of these items or shopping at any of these places, please do so because you heard it on the show and let them know that you heard about that those products on the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. So, D- Dusty, do we have a Chubby Times Tip of the Week this week? You know, I, I'm going, I am going with a Chubby Times Tip of the Week this week, but we're going to base it off turkey hunting just to change it up for one week. 10-4, sounds good. The Chubby Times Tip of the Week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Firearms, use firearms, bows, use bows. Located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morsesportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. You know, you got that big strutter coming in. You, you can hear him every time he gobbles. He's getting closer and closer and closer. And then all of a sudden he goes quiet. And you're like, man, he's gone. <laughs> He's just gone. That that's that's the mental thought that you automatically pick up. Right. But in reality, that turkey's close enough that he feels he don't need to call anymore. Right. And when he's not talking, I'm not talking. 
So just be careful. Don't overcall. When that gobbler gets close, he's going to go quiet mouth probably for the last 200 yards. Just don't overcall. Let him talk to you. And if you need a response to him, do it. But just be real careful on that last 200-yard draw in because, boy, he's going to go quiet mouth and he's going to strut. You'll hear him drumming, and he's going to be real quiet. It's pretty cool, though. That's awesome. Yep, that's, that's a good one. It's and appropriate for this time of year. Dusty, where can we find you? When we're not doing this show right here, right now. Shoot me an email, Dusty at BigBuckRegistry.com. You can look me up on Facebook, Chubby Tines Outdoors, or hit me up on Instagram, at Chasing Antler. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? You can send me an email to Jay at BigBuckRegistry.com. You can always go to our Facebook page where everybody likes to hang out because we have a whole bunch of diehard deer hunting fans hanging out over there. And that's uh, facebook.com forward slash big buck registry. Find us on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash big buck registry. Instagram is instagram.com forward slash big buck registry. You can always give us a call at 724-613-2825. If you would like to submit a buck for viewing on the big buck registry's Facebook wall of fame, go to big buck registry.com forward slash my buck. All the instructions are right there for you. And if you love this show, please leave us uh, so a review and subscribe to the show on iTunes if you could. And check us out on Google Play. That just launched this week. It's the first time ever. Uh, they're making some tweaks. It's not quite all there yet, but it's good to see that Google is in the podcast game. And uh, last but, but not least, um, if you love the show enough and you have a couple extra bucks and you would like to become a patron of this show, uh, there are a bunch, we have a bunch of different categories where you can actually get different things like hats and T-shirts and coffee mugs, things like that. All you have to do is go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash donate. Oh, man, this has uh, just been awesome hanging out. Always a pleasure hanging out with you, my friend. Yeah, likewise, Jay. And, uh, man, I can't wait till next week, Jay. Next week is just another amazing show. Absolutely. You know, don't miss out. Join us every week. We'll be here for, for our listeners and for, for the people that want to learn a little more to take your hunt to the next level. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Can't wait.